Hello, hobby friends, and welcome to today's episode of Hobby Talk. My name is David Baez, and in today's episode, we are going to talk about the exciting world of basketball cards. Today's guest is a seasoned basketball card collector and longtime hobbyist. Here to share more info about the increasingly popular basketball card hobby is Ryan Timmer. Ryan, welcome to Hobby Talk. What's up, buddy? My, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Um, let's get right into it. How did you, Ryan, start in the hobby? So give us a little bit of insight on that. And uh, what did you collect early on and why? I probably had a classic start for my 10th birthday. I got the 1983 top set as a Christmas gift. Um, All right. Owned today in a, you know, the vinyl binder, nine sleeve binders. Um, I collected baseball cards through the height of the hobby, probably ending in 1990. Uh, I was fortunate enough to pack pull uh, a Michael Jordan rookie card. So I started collecting basketball cards. And I Very cool. But that's when the Michael, that's when a 86 Fleer was like, you know, 50 cents, right? Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, I, we, me and my buddies pulled them. My uh, buddy actually put a, a beard on his Michael Jordan. So mine's a little bit better shape oh. than his. Oh, that's brutal. <laughs> Fun memories coming out of, you know, that iconic set. Uh, yeah. When they could actually, you know, pull everybody and they left a brand mint. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know if you've heard me mention this on a previous interview, but uh, I have a funny story I like to share with, with my fellow hobbyists about uh, how I used to go to my local Woolworth store as a child and they had them on clearance like a year or two after they came out. This is like 87, 88. And they were dying to sell me the entire box of packs for like 10 bucks. And I was like, no way. I need my money for my 88 Fleer. <laughs> yes. Well, I, have I have more Greg Jeffries than I do Michael Jordan's. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> Too funny. Then, oh, man. So I, I really did. You know, I went to college. Everything took, took off from the hobby. And then uh, I started actually stock investing in 1987. So I invested okay. in stocks from a pretty young age for a long time. And then when the 2007-8 recession hit, uh, being a big fan of Warren Buffett, he kind of advised picking up assets. Uh, so I really got back into the hobby as an investor. I looked at wine, I looked at art, and uh, you know, looked at sports cards. Uh, sports cards were a lot easier to store than wine was. Right. Uh, that's kind of why I went with wine uh, versus, um, or went with sports cards versus the wine as an investment. It's much yeah. you know, easier to have you know your lineage and, and authentication too. You know, wine has quite a few issues with. Um, yeah. you know, counterfeiting, you know, even more so than our industry does. So that's really okay. sports card investing, you know, roughly a decade ago as, you know, purely an investment. Um, I gravitated towards unopened boxes and packs because that was, you know, like wine, a depreciating asset. The more that you open, the ones that become left unopened uh, increase in scarcity and therefore value. Yeah. So I have uh, quite a large unopened collection. Of course, nobody's perfect. I have also opened a lot over the years. And I have a decent, you know, individual sports card collection too. But the majority of my focus is those unopened packs. And yeah. then a little bit after that, I actually passed the SI, the FINRA SIE test, which is, you know, a securities test. So I could actually, you know, be a little bit more versed in investments. And then uh, started an investment partnership with one of my friends where we invested in the sports card market maybe five years ago. Okay. Now with everyone flooding into the hobby, I, you know, I actually give out investment advice to people kind of that are looking to do that. And occasionally do partnerships where I'll take 20% of the partnership, do all of the work and then have some passive investors in it. So it's, it's really more of an investment these days than a, than a hobby for me, but I can mm -hmm. always the hobby in on the backside, investing in things that I know and love and like. Yeah. I was going to say there's a, uh, you know, the fact that it's, it's something that ties into your, uh, your youth and, and, and what you enjoyed. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it makes it that much sweeter, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Instead of a stock certificate hanging on the wall, you actually have Michael Jordan's rookie card. You know? Yeah. I, I'd much rather have that for sure. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about your transition specifically into collecting basketball um, you know, what, you know, what's your main focus there specifically in basketball and why? Yeah, it started, you know, with my PSA collection, I had two pretty good unopened packed registry sets. One was the 1961 to 89, uh, basketball unopened set. So each one of those packs for those years, uh, in a row. And then I had a 1980s baseball rookie, uh, showing collection. They would have, you know, Roger Clemens, Barry Bonds, but on, on top of an unopened pack so that you could see that card and then grade it. So right. um, 
proud of putting together both of those two sets. It took me a few years to get that together. And then in 2012, um, I thought the uh, bat baseball rookie set was a better set, you know, a little more scarce, a little bit better grades. But Peter right. gave the best of the year registry award to the basketball set. Uh, so I became, you know, more known as a basketball pack collector. And it kind of, you know, at that diverging uh, point, pushed me into the basketball pack collecting realm a little bit more. Yeah. No, that's interesting. So do you mind delving into a little bit more about the uh, PSA set registry piece? Um, that yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, professional sports authenticators have yep. as a set registry. Uh, mm -hmm. Set registry, a lot of them are cards, but they also have pack set registries. Right. Uh, so within the pack set registries, they have several different um, categories that you could do. You could do runs of baseball packs, wax packs, cello packs. Um, you know, various decades, various years, and you know, I just I, I gravitated to basketball because I like the basketball cards. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but I love 1980s baseball too. So I wanted to see all of those rookie cards that I loved collecting as a kid on top of an own open pack and right. there, you know, plastic. And then of course you get a seven and then you need an eight and then a nine and then an eventually a 10. So you're, you're always chasing something with a, with yeah. that large. It never ends, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's about an award. There is a best of the unopened pack award every year. And like I said, I was lucky enough to win that in 2012 with my basketball set. Very cool. So um, let's talk about the uh, current items in your, in your collection. What was the most difficult item, Ryan, for you to obtain and why? Oh, I would probably say, you know, there's two Wilt Chamberlain 1961 uh, rookie card showing packs. Wow. About a decade ago, there was one of them, and then another one came up recently. So I um, was lucky enough, you know, during the recession to be able to find. Wow. Them. And, you know, like I said, there was there was two of them out there. So this yeah. is the first one that I got probably a decade ago. And then here's its twin. Uh, so I now actually own both of the graded Wilt Chamberlain showing. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Hard to find. It's, yeah um you know and yeah that's 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 pretty much a uh, holy grail level right there that's that's an amazing piece pieces yeah. excuse me 60 ones in themselves are pretty rare it's a nice set though because there's very few cards in it yeah you get a front and back showing you know you, you have a decent chance and it's also a pack that you can see through unlike a 1972 which is very hard to see through 60 ones you can pretty clearly see the front and back cards on them very cool so then let's talk a little bit about, you know, you were showing us two awesome pieces to your collection. Do you have any other, you know, white whales or any other items that you'd like to show us? I'd love to take a look at them. Yeah, I have a few. So I like yep. to collect uh, players and then I always try and put together the best possible collection of an individual player that you could. So All right. one of those I've recently done is Shaquille O'Neal. So I'll start with boxes Shaq appears in the 1992 upper deck high series so i get as many boxes as possible and then he also has a stadium club high That's right series, yeah. so he's in that and then the third um, one that he's in is in the top so those cases are easier to hold up um, yeah so hold up one of those today the uh, upper deck and uh, top stadium club cases have a lot more uh boxes in them uh so they're harder to show yeah so, Collect Double doubles as a workout. <laughs> exactly. So I collect the unopened boxes and cases, and then I boil them down and try and get as many of the individual cards as I can too. So uh, here's a PSA ten wow. uh, of the Top Stadium Club. There happens to be ten of those cards graded in a seven or in a ten, and then I have seven of the ten. So oh my god all right the majority of the tens out there by having you know 70 percent of them so i really try and you know focus in yeah deep into individual players as you can he also nicely shows up on the back of uh rack pack so here's a rack pack and as you can see there very cool oh that's a tops okay yeah gold showing on the back so um tops has the regular cards and then the rarer cards are the gold cards and this one actually has a gold showing on the back and I have about 30 of those um, as well in my collection that I've been able to pick up over the years. So again, trying to get as deep in individual players as possible. Yeah. Would you rank Shaq as, as that highest in terms of, you know, 
players that you're collecting or, or is there somebody that you have even more of? That's probably the lowest. Uh, he's funny. I like <laughs> really? Him. Okay. Um, but I really, and this is kind of two players, but I'll, so I'll cheat on that. So in yeah. 81, uh, Larry Bird had his first solo card. Of course, his rookie card is with Magic Johnson in 1980. But this is his first solo card. So I like the uh, that look of that card. So I started collecting the 1981 uh, packs. Very cool. With All Larry right. Bird. And, of course, Magic has a similar card. So I'll collect those. And, again, having the best Larry Bird and Magic Johnson collection unopened is pretty difficult to do. There's a lot of stuff that you have to get. Yeah, but I have things like a Magic Johnson sign, wow. pack, um, which is where his rookie card is held. And then, now, did you actually get that? I'm just curious. Did you get that signed yourself, or yes, yeah. Oh, okay. And then here is, uh, and I love going to the signings. Um, yeah, uh, Bo Jackson is the nicest guy ever, and I have the best Bo Jackson story. But he doesn't play baseball, only football and and. Uh, baseball so we can't talk about that in our basketball segment but definitely future episode material right <laughs> always fun going to the story the um the card has like three different ones so there's a lot of variations of larry bird and magic johnson cards in 1980 so you got right. those all collected there's one with magic there's another one with the individual bird and then the holy grail of basketball cards is the combo larry bird dr j and Magic Johnson, um, the three cards, and you can actually see this one That's, showing through. Yeah, that. there's 51 of these in existence, and I happen to have 11 of those. So wow! I try and go as you know deep as possible in it, and then of course you need to get their uh, their wax. And here is a box uh, that was wrapped by the Baseball Card Exchange, right? As an authenticated uh, Larry Magic Dr. J pack. That's amazing. Wow. And these, you know, there's no population reports on those, but those are fairly rare and hard to uh, track down within the marketplace. I would, I was going to say, I mean, that's the first I personally have ever seen, not that I delve too much into basketball, but just in an open in general, we, we, we see quite a bit through the years and uh, yeah, that's pretty scarce. It definitely takes some looking to be able to find, you know, first you, you know, and Again, understanding the probability theory, you know, the uh, card can show up on the front or the back, but then there's probably sequences. So how many of those packs that are actually out there? And then you have to find one that hasn't been opened, and then you have to get it graded and authenticated. Yeah. It, uh, you get slimmer and slimmer down the probability trail and trying to find these, the more rare and, and of course, scarce the packs are. Yeah, yeah, good point. I've saved the best for last. I oh, here we go. Drum roll. <laughs> Let's see it. <laughs> so one of my favorite packs, uh, George the Iceman Gurvin. Oh, George Gervin. This great. is the only George Gervin showing pack. 74 is a tougher year to see um, a rookie card showing through. So, you know, just by the limitation of that, you're not going to see too many of those. And then I mentioned having an affinity for 1986 basketball. So I have really focused my collection on 1986 basketball, uh, trying to collect all of the rookies showing uh, 86 collation for those that know have a sticker on the back so you can only see the uh, player card on the front uh, basically 132 card set so each player should be on top of one in 132 packs but the pack is exceedingly hard to look through because the bottom is entirely blue that you can't see through All right so you really need the card to be flipped upside down to be able to read the name across the red right them so, you know fairly scarce so that was our Clyde Drexler there's our Patrick Ewing. Very nice. Dominique Wilkins was a rookie in 1986, human yeah. highlight film. Uh, Akeem Olajuwon was the number one pick in the draft, 1984. He's on top of there. Got another Hall of Famer and Carl Malone. Carl Malone, very. My probably favorite personal uh, collection is my Charles Barkley collection, so I have a lot of Charles Barkley packs. Cool. I like the I like the little price tag on it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, this is actually an interesting one. So a couple of years ago at the National Baseball Card Exchange uh, held a raffle where they um, had a box. Uh, and all of these came from that same box. So this one actually came from uh, that at the National a couple of years ago, that drawing. Very cool. And then I believe there is one more rookie in 1986. 
So as I mentioned, there's a sticker on the back. So this is Jordan's sticker showing on the backpack. And then his packs with him showing on front are, you know, fairly scarce. Right. Uh, they probably cost you at least $50,000 if you can find them. And they come up for sale maybe once every two or three years. Um, so what I actually did, instead of getting one with uh, Michael Jordan showing on the front, you can see who's on the front of this pack. It's Bill Lambeer. And, <laughs> You know, why would I say this is the most valuable pack in my collection with Bill Lambeer showing on the front ahead of the Charles Barkley pack? It's because if you know the sequence of these packs, you'll He's know right. Michael Jordan sits right behind Bill Lambeer in the sequencing. So this is a Michael Jordan inside of the pack. Yeah. Field wax pack. Yeah. Is it, is it, is it, is it basically the, it's the one right after or is it two after? I'm not, you said it, right after? Yeah, it's, it's a couple after actually. Uh, yeah. Um, Clark Kellogg is the one right before. Yeah, I re the only reason I say that is because, and again, I'm not well versed at all in basketball, but I remember a couple months ago I saw um, a, a, a live break and it was an 86. Um, and sure enough, I remember that for some reason the Kellogg card stuck with me. <laughs> yep. Yeah. This one right before my, yes. Get excited. Yeah. Be a Clark Kellogg whenever you <laughs> get the drum roll ready, right? <laughs> that is that is amazing. That's a that's a very very cool collection. Um, it makes me cry at the same time thinking about the story I just mentioned earlier. But I need to let that go, don't I? <laughs> well, 1986 is always a great. It's going to be an iconic set. It is something yeah. that other collectors as though it is the most faked pack out there. Um, yeah. Don't know what you're doing when you're looking at those and buying that pack in particular you're more likely to lose money than you are to make money it's one of those things where it's an awesome pack it's an awesome set but i highly um you know encourage folks to buy authenticated packs of 1986 flair there are there are no good deals left out there um yeah. you know, get them but plan on playing uh, paying for you know what you're getting yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think the days of that big find, I'm not going to say they're behind us. There may be some, you know, uh, legitimate find out there from some, you know, hoarder or something. But um, to your point, the best act, the course of action would be to get it from a reputable source yeah. uh, and authenticate it, of course, because to your, I mean, that's probably honestly, Ryan, one of the reasons I don't dabble much with 86 Fleer it's just that inherent fear because of so many, um, you know, fakes that are out there. Uh, same thing with the card. I've always wanted to own a Jordan and I've never bought it because I know there's a lot of fakes out there. Um, and, and even some that have gotten, you know, encapsulated regretfully. Um, so I, I've just been a little gun shy on, on that card for that reason. Jump in, you know. I, <laughs> I need to dip my toe in the water, don't I? The good thing about making mistakes is you rarely make the same one twice. So just get out there, make a, you know, make a lot of mistakes. Try to not make expensive mistakes. And yeah, it's part of the fun of this. Um, but yeah, don't, yeah. you know, you're gonna buy a fake card. You're gonna buy a fake pack. I mean, it's just part of the reality. Figure it out. Mm. Get over it. You know, move on. <laughs> to next up from your experience. Good advice, actually. So thank you. <laughs> so um, let's let's uh, move on here. And uh, I'll ask you, what's the one item that you still haven't been able to find that ranks highest on your list? So I would have to say it's the 1972 Julius Irving showing pack. Um, there are none in the population report, so it hasn't been graded yet. Uh, GAI, which is a previous um, yeah. you know, grading firm, might have had some i've never seen their population report so there's a chance that it might have been out there but i kind of uh, doubt it but if anyone watching this podcast happens to have that pack in their collection let me know i'm i'm looking for it i have dr j cards from other years but that 72 is so elusive and having that purple pack uh, i'm guessing it shows on the top um, yeah. bill jackson there's seven in the population report of him showing on the back so i think it has something to do with collation where julius is on the front and it's just near impossible to see through the front of that pack. Yeah, absolutely. We'll get the word out there. Hopefully, we can find one for you. I could use it. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. So, um, what's let me? You know, I ask this question in any uh, and excuse me in every interview, Ryan. But I always like to get the opinion of um, you know uh, the experts and and the like. You know what their current take is on 2020 and the hobby and this explosion that's going on. What's what's your take on what's going on this year? So I think it's awesome. Uh, again, as an, I entered this as an investor, 
Um, I spent a good decade buying stuff, um, waiting for the appreciation that I saw coming to happen. I didn't expect that, you know, a decade worth of appreciation was going to happen in four or five months. Yeah. Um, that certainly caught me off guard. And, you know, I can look back and say, oh, I wish I would have bought five more of these instead of buying, you know, two of these. Um, but, you know, I think it's it's great. It's very um, interesting for the hobby, though, and to see what happens next, because it has gotten a lot of attention and media attention. So it'll be interesting to see how high it goes before it starts coming down. But I do think it's a natural part of the cycle. I think a lot of people are going to, you know, enter the hobby and we're probably on the top 10 percent of what's happened. Um, I see prices easily doubling over the next three years from where they are today, even at these lofty levels. But there'll be some things that'll sort out. Some cards will go up and down. Yeah. And said with, you know, and get authenticated stuff if you need help, like. You know, there are people that do this as investment advisors. You know, if you don't know what you're doing, have some help in the beginning. It is far less costly to have someone help you with that than it is to make, you know, the 10 years of mistakes that I have up to this point. <laughs> well, to your point from earlier, the mistakes have made you the knowledgeable man that you are today in the hobby, right? <laughs> yes. yes, the mistakes go down quite a bit as you get, you know, through year by year. But in the first yeah. three so there was a decent amount of mistakes. And the nice thing about the hobby is there's a lot of people that are experts in it. And you can go to forums and, you know, post, you know, a box yeah. of open Pokemon cards and say, I found this in a storage locker. Is this something or is this nothing? And people will tell you, you know, some of those kind of things. And so go out there and try it. Don't be afraid yeah. of mistakes. Yeah, no, good advice. So... To end things, Ryan, I like to always ask some fun. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to start calling it the penalty box. It's just giving it, you know, a clever little name, right? But um, I'm going to put you in the penalty box and ask you a couple fun questions if you're up for it. Let's do it. All right. So if you had to give up your entire collection except for one item, and that's going to be pretty tough considering those monsters you showed me, what would it be and why? Oh, wow. There's a, that's a good question. Uh, I'll take the... I'll take the bird magic box uh, is the one thing I wouldn't give up. And a lot of people might say the wilts are a lot more valuable, but I guess with your rules, I could give up one of the wilts and still keep the other one and have one in my collection. <laughs> there you go. Fair enough. I'll let that go. <laughs> so um, last question for everybody is what's one hobby that you're quite interested in and, or, or you're looking to get into and why? So I'll say that I'm all over the map. I really am quite a collector and quite an investor at heart. So I have a decent amount of uh, artwork, um, a decent amount of uh, concert posters, uh, glass work, those kind of things. But the one thing that I say I'm most proud of is I recently put together the best Scooby-Doo comic book collection in the world. I won uh, CGC's uh award for that much like PSA has award. The folks at Greg Comic Books have awards for that. So I put together the uh, first person ever to put together the full set of original Scooby-Doo comic books. Wow, you just blew my mind. I, I never uh, pegged you for a Scooby-Doo comic guy, but that's I'm very intrigued. Scooby-Doo, again, unlike Zion, is Scooby-Doo never gets hurt. <laughs> no, no, no torn ACLs, right? Yes, he's not going to tear an ACL and end up on the injured. He's in the Hall of Fame forever and yeah. still in content. That's awesome. Well, Ryan, I can't thank you enough for, for your time today and for some great insight in the world of basketball. I'd love to invite you back again. Maybe we could talk a little comics. Maybe we could talk a little bit baseball cards. Um, I'm, I'm always up for it. My pleasure. Love doing yeah. it. Great. Thanks again, bud. And we'll talk soon. Take care. Hey guys, thanks for watching today's video. Please click on the like and subscribe button. Just a couple quick updates. We are officially live on iTunes. Google, as well as Spotify for our podcast. Go to hobbynetworkgroup.com for more details and links. Thanks for watching today's video and have a great day. Bye.